And how are my listeners doing? We're at chapter 2, verse 12, the book of Lamentations. Thank you for joining me. It's always a great pleasure. They say to their mothers, Where is corn and wine? When they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their, when their soul was poured out into their mother, mother's bosom. <clears throat> verse 13, What things shall I take to witness for you? What things shall I liken to you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I equal you to, that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your breach is great like the sea, who can heal you? Notes. Well, the statement of this verse is that it is impossible to console Jerusalem by pointing to others in a like affliction, for her misery was greater than there had ever been, and for the obvious reasons. In fact, her misery was so bad that only the Lord could actually heal such. A very sad state of affairs. Verse 14. Your prophets have seen vain and foolish things for you, and they have not discovered your iniquity to turn away your captivity, but have seen for you false burdens and causes of banishment. Notes. When it talks about uh, they have not discovered your iniquity, this means that these false prophets would not point out Israel's sins. They rather preached what Israel wanted to hear. Now the words false burdens refers to false prophecies. The Holy Spirit here says that the false prophets led this parade which led to total destruction. Verse 15. All who pass by clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? Notes. Jerusalem had been the capital of the whole earth because the Lord himself uh, dwelt in Jerusalem, actually in the very temple itself between the mercy seat and the cherubim. Now all of that has come to ruin. Verse 16. All your enemies have opened their mouth against you. They hiss and gnash their teeth. They say, We have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day that we looked for. We have found, we have seen it. Notes. Now these enemies right here are some of the nations that Judah and Jerusalem thought were actually her friends. Jerusalem embraced their gods and thereby they ended up forsaking Jehovah in the process. All the time these friends were secretly hissing and gnashing their teeth in anger. They hated Judah and Jerusalem as they do right now. You see, the problem is, the world is not our friend. Verse 17. The Lord has done that which he had devised. He has fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. He has thrown down and not pitied. And he has caused your enemy to rejoice over you. He has set up the horn of your adversaries. Notes. Now the Lord has done that which he has devised, and it refers to the fulfilling of his word which he had given to the prophets many years before and many times. So the bottom line is that Israel had no excuse. Even whenever Nebuchadnezzar was practically knocking on the door, they still did not listen. Verse 18. And we got a rainstorm going. Anyways, their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion. Let tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no rest. Let not the apple of your eye cease. Notes. While it is true that Judah and Jerusalem are under the judging hand of God, still the Holy Spirit through the prophet implores the people to come before the Lord with a broken heart. And at least mercy in some respect would still be given. Verse 19. Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up your hands toward him for the life of your young children who faint for hunger in the top of every street. Notes. Now, despite the anger of God against Judah and Jerusalem because they would not repent, still the Lord was their only hope and he had always been their only hope. 
So they were exhorted to cry out in the night to him, even though Judah and Jerusalem could not be spared, as is now obvious. Still, the Lord tells these hapless survivors that he can still help, and he in fact would if they would only seek his face. Unfortunately, once again, most of them turned a blind eye to it. Verse 20. Behold, O Lord, and consider to whom you have done this. Shall the women eat their fruit and children of a span long? Shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Notes. Even though Judah and Jerusalem have grievously sinned and refused to repent, which is the cause of all these problems, Jeremiah still pleads for help. Inasmuch as the Holy Spirit allowed this to be recorded, the indication is that the Lord would consider and show mercy. Verse 21. The young and even the old lie on the ground in our streets. My virgins and my young men are fallen by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger. You have killed and not pitied. Notes. Now, the idea of this position, uh, petition, if you will, in this verse is that Jeremiah pleads to the Lord that great judgment has already been carried out on the people, with many killed and others in a state of acute starvation. So now, surely the Lord will show mercy. Uh, you have killed and not pitied portrays the very past tense, surely at the present pity can be shown, in other words. Verse 22. You have called as in a solemn day my terror round about, so that in the day of the Lord's anger none escaped nor remained. Those whom I have swaddled and brought up has my enemy consumed. Notes. When it says, those whom I have swaddled and brought up has my enemy consumed, it seems to refer to the possibility of some of Jeremiah's relatives being killed in the carnage. If in fact this did happen, it would have been a just vengeance carried out by God himself because these very individuals, Jeremiah's family, had uh, sought his life because they did not like what he preached. Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 6. So I mean all y'all out there that are saying that God did something wicked, hey, he got rid of some drains on society right there. Waste of functioning organs. Chapter 3. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Notes. Now, right off the get-go, the prophet speaks here as a representation of the nation. He speaks as a very true intercessor, thereby associating with the sin of the people, even though he himself had not sinned. Well, such was Christ. He knew, uh, he who knew no sin... Uh, entered into the penalty of our sin in order to make proper intercession for the believer, which he does by simply being in the presence of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 7, verse 25. You see, everything which makes possible uh, intercession on our behalf was done and finished at Calvary. So in other words, it's a done deal. Verse 2. He has led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Notes. The idea is this. If a person wills light, God wills light unto him. But if he wills darkness, such is willed unto him. Verse 3. Surely against me he is turned. He turns his hand against me all the day. Notes. Now upon obedience his hand is for me. Upon disobedience... His hand is against me. Verse 4. My flesh and my skin has made me old. Or has he made old? He has broken my bones. Notes. I kind of read that wrong. But anyways. The Lord promised healing to his people as long as they followed him. That's found in Exodus 15.26 and Psalms 103 verse 3. Conversely. If they did not follow him, there would be no healing, but rather curses. A nation that forgets God is truly turned into hell. Deuteronomy 28. I think I've misquoted that a couple of times in earlier teachings, but it is in fact Deuteronomy 28. Verse 5. 
He has built against me and compassed me with gall and travail. Note. Now the idea right here is that the Lord can compass us with blessing or trouble, all dependent upon our obedience or disobedience. Verse 6. He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Notes. Now even though these were God's chosen people still, sin would destroy them just as readily as it destroyed the heathen of old. In effect, talking about the worldwide floods recorded in uh, Genesis, uh, there were in fact two of them. One of them is found in Genesis 1-2. And the other one, you can see the beginnings of it in chapter 6, if my memory serves me correctly. Matter of fact, I think I am right. Anyways, verse 7. He has hedged me about that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Note. Well, it says he has made my chain heavy, and it corresponds to the chain or the weight of sin that we are admonished to lay aside, which... We can do only by looking to Christ and the cross. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. As a matter of fact, that old movie, The Christmas Carol, kind of um, depicts that, if you will, with Jacob Marley. If we do not look to Christ and the cross, it cannot be laid aside and it will become heavier and heavier until we are imprisoned. That's the chain he bore in life and he made it link by link. Sometime you ought to go check out that old Charles Dickens movie. Verse 8. Also, when I cry and shout, he struts out my prayer. Or he shuts out my prayer, I should say. Notes. Now the Psalms said, in Psalms chapter 66, verse 18, if I, regard, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In other words, if you don't repent of your sin before you ask God of any petition... He's simply not listening. Oh, he hears you, but it's a, a prayer that's actually let. It's like a, it's like that terminology in tennis where the ball hits the net and it just simply falls right straight down to the ground. That's what your prayer is doing if you don't get right with him. Verse 9. He has enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. Notes. Now, as the Lord had taken great measures to bless his people in times past, now he takes great measures to do the very opposite. But you must remember, it is meant to be corrective rather than just destructive. You know, I can't think of any time whenever God just wanted to just simply destroy something. He wanted to correct something and correct it very harshly many times, but he never just simply wanted to destroy someone like he had it out for them. Let's just count the devil himself, which is kind of a special case. Verse 10. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait, and as a lion in secret places. Notes. <laughs> now you get the picture right there. You see, bears and lions are very carnivorous animals, and uh, they are incredibly fierce by nature. Therefore, for the Lord to position himself in this manner regarding his children demonstrates his use of measures of extremity. Instead of him being the shepherd, he now turns to a destroyer of the sheep, as Judah woefully found out. It's very simple. If you repent, the lion will turn back into a lamb. As simple as that. Verse 11. He has turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He has made me desolate. Notes. Now in just judgment, the divine hand has broken to pieces the nation uh, which that same hand had established. What God builds up, he is able to pull down. He can do it anytime he wants to. Verse 12. He has bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. Notes. Now the target once was Israel's enemies. Now Israel has turned to be the enemy of God and therefore the mark for his arrow. In other words, they're saying that the Jewish people have a bullseye on their back because they have rebelled. Verse 13. 
He has caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. Notes. Now the reins in this uh, case speak of the very seat of one's being. The Lord shoots the arrow to the place where the sin begins, which is the heart. Now, of course, whenever I talk about the heart, I'm not, once again, referring to an internal organ that pumps blood throughout the body. I'm talking about the very center, inner functionings of a human being. Uh, you can uh, look up the word heart in the Greek and the Hebrew, and it does not really normally fun uh, uh, refer to an uh, uh, internal organ. It more refers to the internal workings of a human being. Anyways, verse 14. I was in a derision to all my people. Wait, I should read that again. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. Notes. Now, the phrase would actually have been better translated, and it should better read, I was a derision to all people, referring to the surrounding nations as they looked upon the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem. And their song all the day refers to songs of mockery and derision by the heathens regarding the destruction of God's people. It could also actually refer to uh, them mocking Jeremiah as well, which more than likely happened. They more than likely wrote songs of jeering to provoke the prophet to anger. Verse 15. He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunken with wormwood. Notes. Now the word bitterness means bitter troubles. The word wormwood actually means to curse. Instead of the Lord blessing Judah, he now curses Judah. Interestingly enough, I have been studying this word wormwood, and it actually translates to Chernobyl. Can't remember if that was in the Hebrew or the Greek, but I'm pretty certain it's in the Hebrew. Hmm, rather interesting. I might have to do some searching on that. Verse 16. He has also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He has covered me with ashes. Notes. When it says he has covered me with ashes, this is actually a figurative expression illustrating a literal point. And it expresses great humiliation because people back in that time had the habit of throwing dust and ashes and sackcloth upon themselves in order to show that they were in deep distress and humiliation. And sometimes they would even go as far as shaving their head bald. Verse 17. And you have removed my soul far off from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. Notes. This very well have been a quotation from Psalms 88.14 because the prosperity addressed here is spiritual prosperity. And of course it results in all other prosperity as well. Verse 18. And I said my strength and my hope is perished from God. Notes. Now Judah, because of her spiritual decline, forgot that her strength and hope was actually God himself. He was the source of all of her blessings, but being lifted up in pride, she began to think that God would not and could not abandon her because of her unique place and position as his special people. So in other words, they got on a little bit of an ego trip. They would find that the Lord could not abide sin irrespective as to who the people were. Verse 19. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. Notes. Now the word remembering in the word remembering is the state of which the Holy Spirit desires to actually draw the person. He wants the person to remember the cause of the affliction and the misery resulting in the wormwood and the gall. Now, wormwood is a very bitter substance. Verse twenty. My soul has them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. Notes. Now verses 19 and 20 are very similar to Psalms chapter 42 verse 5. Now the individual, or in this case Judah, remembers why she is in this condition. And you can see some humility beginning to show. Uh, their oppression is not going to last forever. But unfortunately, 
they would get back on track and they would lose it all together again. I'm talking about the dispersion, but we'll cover that later. Actually, we'll cover it much later. It's actually in the New Testament. Verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Notes. <clears throat> now this verse could well have been taken from Psalms 42 verse 4. Jeremiah's statements thus far concerning Judah have been of despair, but now God's promises of mercy and grace come to his mind. Only this can give him hope, as this is the sure only hope for anyone. Verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Notes. Now we can see the prophet entering back into his intercessory role. He will now learn that God himself, in the absence of all outward spiritual fellowship, is a sufficing portion for faith, and even in the face of what looks like a total catastrophic defeat. The Holy Spirit directs Jeremiah's attention and hence Judah's away from their plight to the Lord's mercies. Okay? In other words, he's getting ready to try and show some mercy. Verse 23. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Notes. Now, in a certain sense, God's mercy cannot be exhausted because it begins anew each and every morning. As well, one can be certain that this will never change because the Holy Spirit says, Great is your faithfulness. Verse 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore will I hope in him. Notes. When it says the Lord is my portion, this proclaims the fact that anything and everything that one truly needs is found in him and only in the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 4 and Psalm chapter 16 verse 5. I guarantee you whenever you take God and you put him in second place, you are giving yourself a trade-off that is of far less value. Okay? Because without him you don't have a future, you don't have a prayer, you don't have nothing. Verse 25. The Lord is good unto them who wait for him to the soul that seeks him. Notes. Now, the idea is very simple. If we properly seek him, even though it may take some time, we will find him. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. Seek and you will find, knock and the door shall be open. Verse 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Notes. It means to wait in travail and with great burden of soul. Of necessity, it is placed beside quietly wait, which speaks of serenity. Therefore, this waiting will incorporate times of travail interspersed with times of serenity. You know, you got these preachers out there that say, Did you give your life to Jesus, everything is just going to be all peachy and all calm and all wonderful. Well, Jesus' response to that was, hey, they hate my guts. Guess what? They're going to hate yours as well. I don't remember the exact verse, but it's in the book of Matthew. Verse 27. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke of his youth. Notes. Now, this verse may have very well been derived from Psalm chapter 119, verse 71. Anyway, verse 28. He sits alone and keeps silence because he has borne it upon him. Notes. Now the idea is that the individual should not blame God for the problem, neither should he complain about his woeful situation, but instead keep silence and bear it with patience, believing that most surely the Lord will come to his rescue and deliver him. Also he will learn the lesson that the affliction is designed to teach thereby coming out better, uh, a better man for the trial. You know, the book of Job, Job is the ultimate example of that. I mean, that guy got drugged through hell pretty much, but yet he waited in patience. He made some mistakes in between here and there, but in the end, he got an audience with God, and that's really what counted. 
I wish I could have a trial like that just so I could simply sit down and talk with God for five minutes. Anyways, verse 29. He puts his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be hope. Notes. Whenever it says he puts his mouth in the dust, this is an oriental manner of expressing submission, which is one of the lessons the Holy Spirit desires to teach. Verse 30. He gives his cheek to him who smites him. He is filled full with reproach. Notes. Now this is an expression that means that he, he bears the affliction with patience, attempting to learn the reason from the Lord and to profit thereby. Even though he is filled full with reproach, just like Job is ridiculed by others, still he knows that the Lord is in control and that victory most assuredly will come. Verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Notes. This is meaning that the Lord will not afflict someone forever, meaning that it will come to an end if they will only trust Him. Now, of course, we have the exception of hell itself, and it will be a land of eternal affliction. We're talking about the earth here. We're not talking about... Uh, in other words, I should say that we're talking about things going on in this world. Once you go to hell, <laughs> the affliction is never going to end. Verse 32... But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Notes. We have the full assurance right here that any grief God deliberately causes is brought about for our good and is done with compassion and mercy. You know, what a wonderful Lord that we serve. You know, whenever I was in the army, I saw a lot of affliction. Believe me, I've seen people get seriously hurt and even killed. And because of that, it was a definite eye-opener as to the condition of this world. And the truth is, I came out of that situation a much better, more acute person because of that situation. And I thank God for it. Uh, the madness of humanity can just be appalling. Verse 33. For he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. Notes. You see, God does not afflict in a malicious spirit like a man does. Men afflict others in order to hurt. God afflicts in order to help. In effect, to bring us to a place of maturity. Whenever I was in the army, I had a lot of growing up to do. Verse 34. To crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. Notes. In this instance, the prisoners of the earth refer to the unhappy Jewish captives of the Babylonians. Even though they had terribly sinned and were therefore under the just judgment of God, still he would not allow them to be crushed. Ultimately, he would still end up delivering them. Verse 35. To turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High. Notes. The idea is that the Most High is the heavenly supreme court. Irrespective of what the individual has done as Judah, if they will sincerely repent, the Lord will guarantee deliverance and restoration and will not turn aside the right of that man. Verse 36. To subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approves not. Notes. Now, his cause refers to the word of God being applied to a person's life and his trust in it. To subvert a man refers to those who claim God will no longer show mercy, etc. Now, the Lord approves not means that irrespective of what unbelievers may say, the Lord will not approve of their denial of mercy and grace to anyone who meets his conditions. And his condition is to simply repent and trust him. All the suffering in the world would probably be lessened if people would just do that. Anyways, we'll have to pick up in chapter 3, verse 37 of the book of Lamentations. Thank you and God bless. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.